You can't right all the wrongs, but it starts somewhere, and I thought an apology was the way to go. Why three years before putting out that video? Everyone's got their own process. My process just happened to be three years. You haven't spoken at all in the last three years about these allegations against you. I thought common sense would address most of it, but common sense is not so common. I've never been arrested, never been charged about these allegations. There's most certainly no victim if you look at the receipts. There's screenshots of these conversations. Are these not conversations that you had? No, those aren't conversations that I've ever had with anybody. If you don't wrestle again, you're gonna go down as one of the biggest what ifs. I wouldn't say I'm a what if. I'm a what can and what will be. Do you miss wrestling? Yeah, I miss it. Patrick, you posted this apology video January 2nd of this year. I think a lot of people are asking, yep. why three years before putting out that video? Um, it's a great question. The three years, I always say that it takes everyone the time that it takes us. Uh, Everyone's got their own process. My process just happened to be three years. Um, I'm in a much better place in my life now, uh, both geographically, mentally, and emotionally, uh, and physically, to be quite honest. And being away from what I'm used to, the city, moving away from Orlando, Florida, uh, and just taking time away from professional wrestling to figure out who Patrick Clark is for the first time in his life without pro wrestling in the back of his head. Uh, I think that's what's given me uh, the three years that I needed to uh, right my wrongs. And, and you can't right all the wrongs, but it starts somewhere. And I thought an apology to the victims, to the people who I affected uh, on a personal and professional level uh, was the way to go. You said in that video that you needed to apologize. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel like you needed to? Well, uh, I need... Uh, the need to apologize is there because so many different people, like I'm saying, have been affected by this. Uh, those who have had disparaging, uh, such negative, nasty comments about me uh, in the public forum, they don't realize that other people are affected just through the power of the word of the mouth. Um, I apologize to the WWE. Uh, WWE is a company. It's an organization put together, uh, as the tagline goes, to put smiles onto other people's faces, uh, to take them away from their reality and their day-to-day -day struggles and negativities. And as the Velveteen Dream, my character, uh, I took that mantle. I took that responsibility to help the WWE in doing that for people. And because of the accusations and allegations levied against me, uh, WWE was no doubt affected. Uh, they had to change storylines. They had to figure out a way to fit me in. And they tried to, uh, up to 14 months after the initial allegations, um, uh, my coworkers, uh, fellow talent, I mean, from the ring announcers to the men and women who uh, donned their capes and their tights and their costumes to come out here and perform. The WWE organization was affected as a whole. And by part, that affects the WWE fan base the people who are tuning in to, as I said, my apology to escape their reality and not to have to deal with Patrick Clark's reality and the BS that, uh, you know, like I said in the apology, uh, the BS that, that, that comes together when you bring immaturity uh, and opportunity and throwing a little high praise in there. And, uh, you know, you got the mess on my hands. You also apologized to Triple H. Yes. You apologized to Shawn Michaels. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel like it was important to specifically apologize to them? Uh, so it takes a village. None of us, uh, I'm learning that none of us can do it or have done it on our own. Uh, and Triple H, Paul Levesque, and Shawn Michaels, uh, most people may know them as D-Generation X, as a collective, as, you know, a story told through the annals of WWE television throughout the years. I know Triple H as my boss, uh, as the man who I go to work for and with to achieve a specific goal. Um, and I know Shawn Michaels personally as my coach, as my mentor. Shawn is a man that I've attended church with. Um, I've sat and shared meals with Shawn before. Um, Shawn has met my parents and my siblings and my family. Uh, and I, Sean's. So, um, there can be uh, chatter regarding whether or not uh, 
the apology was calculated, if you will, to try to get my job back. Um, I don't have a job there anymore. I haven't had a job in three years. I can't get something back that no longer belongs to me. Uh, and secondly, Triple H has put together an awesome product in NXT, and it's reflective in Raw and SmackDown. And Shawn Michaels, who, uh, to my knowledge, is now uh, carrying the mantle in NXT, he's just spent so much time and effort into me. I met Shawn and was blessed to be put in this class uh, with many other great talents in about 2017, February 2017. So, I mean, got released in April of 2021. That's a four-year relationship. That's like uh, having a principal in high school for four years. I mean, four years, um, the time under tension, the time that he and Paul, Sean and Paul, invested in me to make me the Velveteen dream and to make me worth a damn to WWE NXT TV, uh, they definitely deserve an apology. What do you think that people need to know about your life over the last three years to understand where you're at right now? Um, I think it's important for people to know that there is a separation between the Patrick Clark, who I introduced the world to on Tough Enough, uh, from the Velveteen Dream character, uh, there's a distinct difference between those two. But overall, the last three years of my life, like I said, I'm learning who Patrick Clark is without pro wrestling. The Patrick Clark that I introduced people to in 2015 on Tough Enough, he was a wrestling smart mark. He just, you know, he was a fan who loved it, always wanted to be right about it, always wanted to be in the know. He wanted to be fan number one. Uh, and then when I jumped the barricade, so to speak, and I went from a uh, consumer of the wrestling product to a uh, provider of the wrestling product. Uh, I took elements of Patrick Clark from Tough Enough to try to create the Velveteen Dream. And when you're starting out on TV, 2015, I'm 19 years old. Uh, 2017, now I'm 21 and I'm the Velveteen Dream. Uh, up until my departure from the company in 2021 when I'm 25 years old. I mean, in six years at such an immature age, it's a lot being thrown at you. Um, and it's easy to believe a narrative. If you have people coming to you telling you, you're, you know, you're the hottest thing since sliced bread, you're the next this, you're the next great that, you're the prodigal son, so to speak. It's easy to uh, get swallowed up in all of that and to lose the focus of why I decided to wrestle in the first place. I didn't do it for fame. I didn't do it for money. I did it because I love professional wrestling. It provided an escape for me uh, at a very young age when I was figuring out that my stepfather was not my biological father, um, when I'm losing my grandmother to breast cancer, um, when I'm grieving and dealing with all these different uh, interpersonal uh, uh, experiences. It's difficult to find out who you are, especially when you can just run to pro wrestling at the end of the day and just be done with everything. Uh, Patrick Clark now, today, is way different than that. Uh, I grew up in D.C., spent my early uh, 20s in Orlando, Florida with WWE. I was new to the money. I was new to the success. I was new to the world. And three years down the road, here we are, 2024. That's no longer new to me. I've traveled in multiple continents and countries. I've been blessed to see my face uh, on billboards, on little pay-per-view chairs, um, to see merchandise, people. I, I know the support is not, not uh, unfamiliar like it once was. Uh, I realize that this is support that I get from outside voices, from outside energies and people. Um, it's more than just hearing the good. Um, you got to hear the good and hear the bad. And at the end of the day, I've learned that it's all human. That's how we're interconnected. And I'm, I'm taking the time it's taken me to become a decent, a good human being to earn my wings while I'm here. You talk about support. And when you look at the comments on the video that you put out, 
There's a lot of positive comments. You went through, you hearted a lot of them. You liked a lot of those. Yeah. What did it mean to you to see that support from fans and also some of your former colleagues? Uh, it means a lot. Uh, it means a lot coming from everyone because uh, four or five years ago, uh, getting wrapped up in the Velveteen Dream, I didn't have an appreciation for it and I almost pushed it away uh, to a fault uh, because I wanted to live in my world. I wanted to see things the way that I wanted to see them. And having that world stripped away from you, the, the Velveteen Dream mask taken off and thrown out, uh, I get to focus on how people feel about Patrick Clark, uh, not as a character, not as an actor, not as a wrestler. Uh, I get to know how people feel about the human Patrick Clark. And I mean, I heard it a lot because it was a lot of positive. You can't please everyone. And that's not why I'm here. That's not why I put out the apology. Uh, but to know that I can re-earn the trust of so many people who just gave it to me blindly. You know, I didn't have an appreciation for the trust and the love that comes with being in the public light. Uh, I abused it and I wasn't very kind to it. And so I had to reap what I sowed. You know, I, I lost my opportunity. You didn't talk at all in that video and you haven't spoken at all in the last three years about these allegations against you. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not address them? Uh, well, one, I thought common sense would address most of it, but as a lot of us know out there, common sense is not so common. Uh, the allegations levied against me, um, two very harsh ones, uh, involved inappropriate communications with minors. Uh, and so we don't narrow this thing down. That's anyone who is not of legal age, I'll assume 18 years or younger, um, who's not considered a legal adult, um, and you're having inappropriate communications with them. Uh, and that's either to solicit something from them or you, know, you just don't have positive thoughts. Those, you know, the person trying to do those things, they, they're not pure of heart. You were called a groomer. Yeah, a groomer. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't all I was called. I've been called a pedophile. I've been called pedo, nonce. Um, very hurtful um, and damaging uh, titles to give a person. I didn't earn that. I don't have a, a, a history of malicious acts toward anyone. I never have. Everyone's got a past. Everyone's got lessons that they learn from and that they grow through. Um, everyone's got a past. Not everyone has a history, and a history is a repeated behavior, repeated offenses over and over and over again. And I've never, ever had a history. Um, I've been around my coworkers, children. Um, hell, in my personal life, uh, I did Gerald TC for 10 years, and that's Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps for those who don't know. I did Young Marines from the age of eight years old in 2003 up until the age of 18 years old. Um, I, I've been in leadership positions around people drastically younger than me. And that was for that time at 18. I'm guiding youth from eight to 18 uh, at a young age then. I've never in this life or my last life, and I don't plan on the next life, to ever have such maliciousness and malcontent in my heart that I would want to do harm like that to anyone. So there's screenshots of these conversations mm -hmm. uh, with a 16-year-old, 17-year-old. Mm -hmm. Are these not conversations that you had? No, those aren't conversations that I've ever had with anybody, uh, minor or adult, legal, illegal, consensual, non-consensual. Those words, those texts, those images that have been pushed out there on the internet, they're all false. Um, I actually went and uh, took the liberty to dig up some receipts, some notes, uh, do some research on my own. Uh, April 24th, 2020, a Joshua Schmidt, who uh, goes by at NXT underscore fan underscore, that account is no longer uh, 
uh, accessible. That account has been uh, abandoned and taken down. Uh, at Naya Not Jax and at Black Girl Monty and at Ayo Dotty. Um, these four accounts all reposted on April 24th, April 24th, 2020. They reposted and uh, pushed out these false images, these doctor images, quite frankly. Uh, they're the Josh Fuller guy who uh, is the second allegation against me. So this he is actually, a conversation you never had? No, no. Is not someone with, you've never shared never DMs with? Met, never have uh, shared DMs with. Not those DMs that you saw. Now, on April 24th, 2020, I put in my DMs as the Velveteen Dream, okay? Because my social media has only ever been, up until now, it's personal social media uh, as Patrick Clark Jr. But when I was working for the WWE, my Twitter and my Instagram, the only two accounts I had, were strictly for the Velveteen Dream. I did speak to a Joshua Schmidt, um, excuse me, a Jacob Schmidt on... Uh, Instagram, we actually had a phone conversation over Instagram. Uh, at no point in time uh, did I ever type anything or say anything that should have or could have been misconstrued as an advance of any type. But I guess there's people that are going to say, why are you trying to be friends with a 16-year-old? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> there's been a lot of people that have said a lot of things. Um, the one thing to be very clear about it's not a friendship. Uh, it's a mentorship. It's a, I can only akin it to the big brother, little brother program. You know, uh, one, if I'm going to help anyone, I'm more inclined to help a male. I'm not a female uh, biologically, or I don't identify as a female. I don't understand what it takes to make money in the professional wrestling world as a woman. So this is, a fan reaching out saying, I'd like to be a pro wrestler. Is that what this was? That's all it was. Okay. Uh, that's all any of my contacts outside of my close friends, anyone that I've spoken to. I'm a pretty private person. Um, if I'm speaking to you, it's nine times out of 10, I'm in a capacity to help you in some sort of way. Uh, I tend to do things on my own. Uh, part of growing out of my immaturity was learning that, like I said, it takes a village. You can't do things alone. And where I thought I was maturing was allowing people who I didn't know um, to have communications with me, not realizing the spot that I was in. Um, socially, uh, culturally, and a bit politically. So this is April 2020, the world shut yeah. down, everybody's at home. You, you're just saying, my DMs are open? As is that what it was? Yep. That was literally the message. Uh, dreams, speaking in third person as Velveteen Dream, uh, Dreams DMs are now open. Put that in my Instagram story. Like you said, COVID had just started. Kobe had been in the helicopter uh, crash earlier that year, and they had just shut down schools. Now, this first allegation came from someone from Canada. Okay? So, and I bring up schools because in my voice message, uh, it was what do you call it, uh, edited out uh, uh, voice bite was taken from it where I asked, what school do you go to? Now, again, I'm as Velveteen Dream when I'm asking this question. It has a bit of an undertone to it um, because of the voice that I'm using. I, I talk like this when I'm the Velveteen Dream. I drag things out. Uh, I'm very handsy and just grandiose when the Velveteen Dream is speaking. And as the Velveteen Dream, I said, what school do you go to? Now, mind you, this is COVID. There's nothing malicious about a question like that. When I ask someone what school they go to, it's to help them pursue their next journey in wrestling. Professional wrestling is not like college sports. You can't apply to a school to become a pro wrestler unless it's a pro wrestling school. So depending on where you are in the country, I can kind of tell you, okay, if you live in the Northeast, you're near Allentown, PA, you can go visit Samu, Brother Sam of the Wild Samoan Training Center. If you're on the Southern Eastern part of the United States, you can visit the other Wild Samoan Pops who runs his uh, Wild Samoan Training Center in Claremont, Florida. Then if you're over here uh, in California, 
You've got Rikishi that's got Knox Pro. you got Santino Bros, not to be confused with Santino Morella's Battle Arts Academy up in Ontario, where you're from. Yep. Um, and ironically, where this first accuser's from, Ontario. When I ask you what school you go to and, and what grade you're in, because depending on where you are in life, things seem so big to you. I mean, I just turned 28 in October. Um, and... I didn't know anything that I thought I knew when I was 25. And when I was 25, I thought I was grasping the knowledge of the world. And I had no clue, you know? As I get older, I realize that this too shall pass. Very, uh, very strong message that I've kept close to my heart since uh, the initial allegation. This too will pass. Um, when you're young, it doesn't seem like anything's going to pass. It seems like you're in the storm forever because you don't have enough quality experiences in life to compare the good and the bad to. So when I'm asking you these questions, uh, it's not a job application. It's almost a mini questionnaire to vet out who I want to help and who I don't want to help. Uh, because at the time, I'm working for WWE. It might be COVID, but WWE was granted access to uh, the talent as uh, essential workers. So I'm still working during COVID, right? But schools are closed down. No one's waiting outside in a van or an ice cream truck trying to meet people, trying to harass children and things like that. Again, I don't even have a past of that, never had a past of that, and I've never had a history of that. I have a history of wanting to help people, a history so strong and rooted in wanting to help people that if you look at the WWE video game, um, WWE 2K20, I believe, um, and that was released... October 22nd, 2019. I mentioned earlier there was some funny timing to this, uh, to all of this. Uh, that was released October 2019, WWE 2K20. Now, in the storyline of WWE 2K20, your character meets the Velveteen Dream. And the Velveteen Dream takes your character under his wing. Uh, the video game wouldn't use the word groom. They would use the word help help your character become an NXT superstar. I don't find it to be uh, any paradox that that's kind of the same narrative that has been followed in these false accusations. What about the next accusations? This is from uh, Joshua Fuller. Yes. And that included some photos. Yes. Now, Joshua Fuller claims that the photos came from the uh, first accuser. I have a list. Uh, okay actually already shown it to you, but just, uh, just to cover my basis and to show that I've got my receipts all together. This is a list of, and it's highlighted, and there's some names on the back, a WWE list of talents. Uh, that had leaked that nudes. That had leaked right nudes. Now. So I have a hard time trying to, I look at it as prosecute myself, trying to explain where people have gotten images that a lot of people have nudes all over the internet. You know, how they get there, who knows? I'm not here to speculate uh, because speculation can't do anything but more damage. We're just throwing more guesses in the air, letting our imaginations run wild. I'm not here to do that. Uh, the crimes that I was accused of committing, those are federal crimes. Those are litigious issues. Uh, those are things that people, people don't come back from. I have another list. Um, it should be pointed out, you were never arrested for anything? Never. You were never, well, associated with this, I should say. Uh, you were not charged with anything associated with this? No, I've never been arrested, never been charged, never had to file a police report. Um, when we're talking about this, we'll get to we're the talking about these uh, allegations. other arrests later. Yes, never. Um, I have a list of celebrities uh, with charges against minors. Now, whether they were convicted, I didn't get that too deep into their rabbit hole, uh, but these are some pretty well-known people. Um, Roman Polanski, uh, Ezra Miller, the actor from The Flash, uh, That 70s Show's Danny Masterson, uh, singer and songwriter R. Kelly, actor Jerry Harris from Netflix's uh, series Cheer, um, former politician Anthony Weiner, um, former coach Jerry Sandusky, um, Michael Jackson in 2004, Jim Brown, uh, NFL running back in 85, uh, Reverend Run from Run DMC in 1991, uh, 
Tupac in 1993, Sean Kingston 2010, CeeLo Green in 2012, Nelly 17, uh, Cal Massey from That's So Raven had allegations as recent as 2021. And then, uh, you know, someone very dear to the hearts of many over here in Cali, you got Kobe Bryant, who's accused in 2003. Uh, these are high profile individuals and I'm not likening my success or where I am uh, culturally to these men. Um, but one, they were all men. And two, uh, they were all entertainers. Uh, I consider politics to be a bit of American entertainment, the oldest form. All entertainers, uh, people of interest, so to speak. There is no way Patrick Clark, who performs The Velveteen Dream, working under the WWE umbrella, uh, on the USA Network, in America, is accused of the crimes that I'm accused of and against who I'm being accused by, and nothing happens. There's no cover-up. There's no paradox. There's no grand scheme or plan that, you know, has been buried deep below the earth. It's false. That's where I'd like to think common sense would kick in. But again, this proves that common sense is not common at all. Well, WWE did an investigation about mm -hmm. this. Yep. Triple H said that uh, they did the investigation and they didn't find anything. Uh, yeah. And I'll actually read that statement. Okay. Because a lot of people, I don't think, uh, got that statement. So this is Triple H, uh, and I quote, You know... In this day today, accusations are made and you take them all very seriously. Look into them the best you can and you find out what is there and what isn't. In this situation, Clark was also involved in a car accident. That's what took him off TV. In the moment, all this other stuff happens and you look into it and you find that there is a situation that people bring to everyone's attention. You look into it and find that it is what it is and there's nothing there, end quote. That came from Triple H regarding the allegations levied against me. Now, remind you, WWE is a country that caters to children. They sell T-shirts and hats and wristbands and toys and belts and all types of things that will entice a younger audience. They're not going to... Uh, Vince McMahon and Triple H have been on record. No one's bigger than WWE. They're not going to do all of that. I mean, I've got an ego, but even my ego isn't that big to be delusional in a case like that, that someone accused of these crimes would be protected. You know, it, it doesn't happen. So what are these DMs, these messages that mm -hmm. you sent to Josh Fuller? Well, very simple. I only sent one uh, message to Josh Fuller, and that was over Twitter. Um, these are for you. So we'll, we'll read along here. All right. So one I sent to Josh Fuller... Uh, after we had separated, after I decided to not help him uh, in 2018, early 2019, I reached out and tried to uh, get Josh's attention. I missed a call from him. Uh, and we were kind of playing phone tag. Uh, on April 4th, 2019, a year before the allegations, um, I asked Josh Fuller to call me back. Um, I did it in all caps. Again, this is the Velveteen Dream tweeting. Um, and were you also, friends with him? At this point? We weren't friends. We never were friends. I was helping him for a short amount of time. He ended up getting uh, two concussions. And my he, suggestion... He's a wrestler? He fancies himself as a wrestler. I'm not sure if he ever completed training, but uh, that's why wrestling school is so important, man. Because anyone can just throw up a ring in a building uh, outside at a pavilion. And people are getting hurt every day. And this is the issue that I had with Josh Fuller. Uh, Josh ended up getting two concussions. And instead of listening to me after I asked him to stop wrestling, to go see a personal doctor and then go see a second one. So you've got two opinions. Uh, he decided to go and continue to wrestle. And I had to cut him off. Now, what I've learned through my immaturity is it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And you can cut people off but you can still be respectful and you can do it with love and compassion. Um, still a work in progress. 
and I'm still working on ways to cut ties with people. I mean, we all do to this day. We never, you know, stay at the hip with anyone in our lives, brothers or sisters included. Um, heck, look at parents and their children. You know, no one's going to stay together. And Josh and I had met uh, a point in my mentorship to him that he was no longer willing to listen. He was going to hurt himself. And I was afraid that if he did hurt himself, that it was going to fall back on me because I was publicly, as you can see, I tweeted out to him. I was publicly helping him. I have no issue helping people um, because my heart is in the right place. You wanted to help him become a pro wrestler. Yeah, I started young. I started wrestling. I got my first wrestling license when I was 18 years old. I, start, I graduated high school when I was 17. So when I was 15, 16 years old, my mind was already turning. The gears were spinning trying to figure out where are you going to go? How are you going to get this done? My plan was to wrestle on my four-man wrestling team uh, at Forestville Military Academy. Uh, I wanted to get a scholarship so bad to Kent State University because Dolph Ziggler wrestled there. Um, and then I was hoping that I met a Briscoe along the way and got an opportunity to try out. Um, God works in amazing ways, and I've had my own unique path to getting there. Uh, but that's normally my thought process. Uh, you have to be real about, you know, other people's journeys because mine was so unique. I mean, on WWE reality TV, when I'm 19, I'm a, uh, a consistent performer as the Velveteen Dream. Uh, by the time I'm 21, and I'm traveling the world, and I've got John Cena and Mick Foley and Kurt Angle and Paul and Sean saying beautiful things about me on a public forum, all before I'm even 25, you know? Um, everyone doesn't have it like that. So I have to be realistic when I'm entertaining conversation with anyone as far as, well, what do you want to do? Because it's definitely possible. No matter how unique my journey, it's definitely possible to do this job and to do it well and have people love and admire you because of it. Just got to have your head in the right spot. So what about these screenshots of yeah. these nude photos? Well, first, Josh Fuller on June 19th, 2020, uh, put out his first post. He said, I've been debating releasing this information for months now, but with everyone speaking out, I finally feel comfortable in doing it. Part of me is still terrified for disclosing this. Then he goes to make a very strong uh, statement. Uh, Josh calls me a groomer and a child predator and says he's going to post more proof in the tweet below. Uh, so I've separated them. We have his, uh, I call it his three-page, man, his three-note manifesto of his lies. Uh, and we'll get into that. Then I've got... Uh, Facebook conversation. This is from Facebook messages. The way he posted it, it comes across as a text message thread. And you can see in the Facebook messages, I actually share my number with him. These are messages from May of 2016. Right. This is what okay. I have here. And uh, the last one is a screenshot that he claims, Josh claimed, was from two separate devices where they've once again doctored this picture that they found of me. Um so let's talk about this. Yeah. You're having this Facebook conversation. This is May of 2016. Yeah. You ask, age, what do you do for a living? What are you coming to Orlando for? Basic questions. He says he's 16. You have a conversation here uh, that he's going to be in town for a yearly vacation. I think there's going to be people that are going to go, he says he's 16. Why are you even continuing this conversation? Well, I'm 19 at the time. Uh, it's the first time in my wrestling career where I feel like I can actually help people uh, and be doing a good job while I'm helping people. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I get a thrill being able to say, I helped that person get to where they are. You know, you, we don't, it's hard to find someone that's just going to help you because they just want to see you do well. Um, Again, egos running wild at the time. I'm like, I would love to be the Velveteen Dream who's not only a great performer, but I can build great performers. Like, I can be all things to everyone. That's not true. Uh, and it's important to get into the nitty-gritty. First of all, these text messages that he saved 
were from May of 2016. Now, he goes in his three-note manifesto and claims that uh, he's got a recording from Discord, which is a streaming platform, and that he's had friends that have been on the phone line that have heard me say uh, just wicked things to him. Um, so I look at these messages that he kept from May of 2016 when he was 15, and I'm so curious because when you read the messaging, uh, he seems to be baiting me. Uh, in hindsight, he asked me, uh, let's see, he says, What's hey, I'm going to be in Orlando in August. This is a 15-year-old, mind you. Hey, I'm going to be in Orlando in August if you're around. Let's go bowling or something. That's the first message. That's the first message he ever sent me on Facebook. He wants to hang out. That's the first thing I take And you from say, that. sounds great, but I'd rather know some more about you before we start, quote, hanging out. Yep. Uh, that was my way of trying to calmly defuse uh, him. He seemed very anxious to just know me. Um, is a, that is an interesting first message that he sent. Let's yeah. go bowling or something. Yeah, I mean. And he's just sending this as a fan like, hey. Like I've known him for years. I met okay. him, uh, a guy named Brandon Green who trained me out of Ground Zero Wrestling in Virginia. Uh, Brandon was one of my first trainers, trained me in a shed back in 2014. Um, Josh Fuller is one of Brandon Green's students. Uh, so when I was coming to visit Brandon Green, I was introduced to Josh Fuller. Again, I'm not trading phone numbers. There's nothing malicious. There's nothing on my end uh, where my heart's not in the right place. I shared Facebook information. And this is after Tough Enough. This is... Uh, before I got Twitter and Instagram. So we talked over Facebook. Uh, he says it sounds cool to him. There's not really much besides him to being his average teenage wrestling fan, though. Is there anything I want to know? Um, yeah, how old are you? Uh, what are you doing for a living? Uh, and what are you coming to Orlando for? These are basic questions to me. I don't see anything that, you know, I want to be careful because I don't want to push him away and seem like an asshole off of first meeting this guy. Uh, but what's I do your, think they're basic questions. What's your intention at this point? To just help him out, to be a guy. <clears throat> I've, I've been helped tremendously. I've had uh, Calvin Reigns who trained me. Uh, Calvin Reigns, uh, his name's Pat Brink. Calvin Reigns was his name in FCW. He was training me when I was 17, 18 years old. I do UPS holiday uh, jobs. You know, you hop on the truck, you help deliver packages. I was Pat's little sidekick for a winter, and I picked his brain like it wasn't anybody's business. When you're me, you are so obsessed with professional wrestling. That's why it's been such a release for me these past three years. That's why the apology can come so easily for me after uh, three years. Because at first, I felt like I owed no one an apology. I didn't see any victims. There most certainly no victims, if you look at the receipts, uh, from grooming or child predation or anything like that. There are no victims. So how do we get from here to these nude photos? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to speculate. I can tell you face-to-face, man-to-man, I didn't send anybody any nudes of me. No man, no woman, no child. So what are these screenshots? Uh, these are screenshots of the messages from Facebook, uh, his three-note manifesto. Which we can get into that right after. that he's taken from God knows where, probably the same images uh, where you can find other people that I've shown you on that list. Uh, I just, I can't explain that. And me trying to wrap my head around that and why the story surrounding the pictures would be so malicious, uh, that's energy that I just don't have time for anymore. I have to let that go in the past. There's no, there is no explaining it. This has been looked at by my former company, WWE. This has been looked at, I'm sure, by uh, police and whatever proper authorities that need to handle this type of stuff. I can only be a man of my word. I can only tell you the truth. Uh, and not to be cliche, but my truth. Uh, and my truth is I've never, uh, not to Josh, not to a Jacob, not to a Jingleheimer Schmidt, I haven't sent anyone any nudes of me. So Joshua puts out this long note, which you gave mm -hmm. me a copy of here. Yep. Do you want to read the whole thing? Do you want to read portions of this? Uh, no, we should read the whole thing. Okay, go uh, ahead. Josh starts out, and I quote, Josh says, been wanting to release this message ever since his ac accusations a few months back. 
I feel terrible not speaking up until now, but there is no doubt in my mind the Velveteen Dream attempted to groom his teenage accusers. I met Patrick right after he left Tough Enough at an indie show, and he told me to add him on Facebook. I was 16 at the time, and he was 19. One day, he video called me out of nowhere and then sent me his number afterwards. We would then become friends, at least I thought, and would frequently FaceTime after his NXT house shows. He was always really secretive and paranoid about me telling people I knew him. I always had a really uneasy feeling when I would talk to him as he spoke very manipulatively and aggressively. I highlighted this for you, Chris. Josh then goes on and says, There weren't any direct advances made at that time, but everybody I spoke to would tell me he was trying to come on to me. We stopped speaking for a while, and then recently we reconnected. He even told he even took me to his old training school a year ago and attempted to be a mentor figure. That's when I reached out over Twitter. Um, after he says that, highlighted this. My last interaction with him was a FaceTime call, which is why I bring up the May 2016, because if you've kept records from 2016, surely you've kept all these disparaging things you claim that I've put out there toward you, hmm. right? But again, lies. Um, Josh says, my last interaction with him was a FaceTime call with him where he had insisted that I show off my body to him, saying he wanted to see my progress in the gym. I took my shirt off, but reluctantly, and felt really uncomfortable about it. He then referenced wanting to see my lower body as well, to which I declined. I highlighted this for you, Chris. Upon leaving that call, I had realized that I had still been on Discord with a few friends of mine, to which they'd immediately acknowledged that they heard everything of me being harassed. So you have recorded evidence on Discord, right? Where did it go? You have messages from 2016 you've been holding on for a weird amount of time. Uh, and then you make claims that, you know, you're on a streaming service with multiple people and no one has any footage or tape recording because I don't have a history. I don't have a history or a past of this. Um, Josh then goes on to say, I've worn that shame for the past few months and have felt very taken advantage of ever since. Upon hearing the recent claims on him, I was immediately heartbroken for the victims as many of the conversations I'd seen were conversations that he had with myself, such as wanting to get them in shape so he could help them get to WWE. Highlighted this part for you, Chris. Josh says, I would like to say that Patrick was never directly sexual to me. That's an interesting thing to point out because this has been, for the last three years, for, there's a lot of people that have made you guilty in the court of public opinion that this has been a sexual thing. For the accuser to say here, I would like to say that Patrick was nev never directly sexual to me, doesn't seem like it's really been brought up. No, and again, I go into common sense is not that common. This guy, first of all, timeline-wise, um, the note's not important for this one. Timeline-wise, uh, the first accusation came out. Triple H went on record during an NXT TakeOver conference call, I think for v Vengeance Day, TakeOver Vengeance Day. Uh, he goes on a conference call and makes a statement that I read earlier. Right. Uh, that should have effectively cleared me of any crimes and wrongdoing that people wanted to believe was out there about me, but it didn't. Josh Fuller then gets on his Twitter um, and pushes this hashtag Fire Velveteen Dream, pushes this groomer and child predator narrative, and if people just took the time not to read the headline, not to read the uh, big, bold letters, and read the fine print, Josh says it in his own little Three note manifesto, I would like to say that Patrick was never directly sexual to me. He also said earlier that there were no advances made toward him. But then he later says Patrick Clark is a child predator and should not be succeeding in the wrestling business. He said Patrick, Josh said that Patrick Clark is a predator and should not be succeeding in the wrestling business. And I think that, again, if you read the fine print, he, he reveals his, his scheme right then and there. He reveals it right then and there. Josh is a very simple story. I tried to help Josh. Josh got injured and did not want to listen to reason. 
He was living his dream. I understand getting excited, being up and close on a wrestling ring, touching a turnbuckle, feeling the tape peeling off the road. I get all that. But health and safety uh, comes first. And that comes with being mature. Now, I wasn't the most mature, but I had some common sense that I could lean on. You know, I didn't want to do everything the hard way. Some things I just listen to and do the easy way. And your health is so important. Your, your body is what creates money for you in the wrestling business. You don't have to look like Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior. You don't have to be a genetic anomaly like uh, Andre the Giant or a Big Show. Uh, and you don't have to be the most athletic, like you got a Strickland and a Ricochet out there. But you must take care of your body because when the checks and the royalties dry up, when you're too old to get out there in front of that crowd, when the only time you're hearing that theme song is from a YouTube off a cell phone, you'll still have your body. And you got to preserve that. Josh didn't have any type of understanding for that at the time, and he lashed out. He lashed out here, and it says it in one of his last lines, he claims that I'm a groomer, a predator, and that I should not be succeeding in the wrestling business. I don't know if anyone else who, out there who could relate to the Speak To movement and the Me Too movements. I don't know if having someone stripped of their profession, of their livelihood, is what a lot of people want out of speaking up and telling real stories. And really trying to be heard out there. Because there are a lot of deceitful and evil and nasty men and women out there who do prey on the naive, the unsuspecting. And those people get away just like these accusers, these false accusers, these false uh, narratives out there, these writers, these uh, fake journalists, if you will, that just put out these nasty, nasty rumors. And they're not held accountable. So where does it go from here? You keep wrestling on NXT yep. until the end of 2020. Your last match is December of 2020. Yep. With but Adam you're Cole. still under contract. Still under contract. Um, and again, that's why I apologize to Sean and Paul in the video because uh, they work so hard to keep me in the mix, to fight this, not for me, but with me. And... We all put forth our best foot, but no man can open a door that God has closed, and no man can close a door that God has opened. And that's what I can take away from this. It just, my time was up. My time was up. So you get released in, is April 2021? April of 2021. And then you go on what you refer May to. May of 2021. May of 2021. Yep. You, 13 you, months. You go on a, a downfall, as you call it. Yep. You said you, you were losing yourself. Mm -hmm. what, what happens there? Um, when the false accusations came up, I didn't know how to approach my family and loved ones and close friends. Um, I didn't know how to cope. I didn't know how they would cope. And I didn't want to give it an opportunity to find out because I was afraid of, I lost so much love and respect and my image was just tarnished in the public uh, form. I was afraid to know what that looked like in my personal life with my family. So I decided to stay in Orlando, Florida, uh, two and a half years longer than I should have. Um, and this is where I got into real legal uh, issues. Um, first arrest uh, was in 2019. Uh, it was probably a week after Halloween. I went down to Miami to Hocus Pocus Festival um, and got some illegal substances from a guy. And never used it, kept it in my wallet. So what do you know? See how God works, how he's got to slow you down and, you know, you know, he's got to humble you in his way. I got pulled over for a uh, headlight infraction. My lights were not on at night. <clears throat> I got pulled over for that. 
when I'm reaching in my wallet to pull out my ID, little baggie falls out. This is cocaine? This was cocaine. Yep, that's the uh, illegal substance. And this is where they got twisted in the uh, in the headlines or in the news of mm -hmm. you did cocaine in front of a police officer. Yeah, that's so, that is so bizarre. I mean, but what I've learned too is when you don't speak up for yourselves, the narratives will get as big as you allow them to get. Uh, I should have been stepping on necks and squishing narratives out the gate. But I sat silent because, one, I didn't know how to cope. And two, I assumed someone was saving me. Someone would finally be there to my rescue. Um, he came. God did. Not in the way that I expected. But uh, this was one of those times where he was saving me. So this is, if this is 2019, you're under contract with WWE at the time when this yeah. happens. Yes. Okay. What are the repercussions in WWE for this? Um. Well, let me see. This was actually dated. Actually, no. Let's see. 2019. I misspoke. The years are flying by. So this, uh, I'm looking at three court documents right now. Okay. First one is a motion opened at 1.53 p.m. on April 21st, 2022. Okay. So I was not employed with the WWE okay. at the time. Um. Again, they got me for no lights at night, uh, no lamps or illumination, and possession of cocaine. Um, that was the first arrest in April of 2022. Okay, April of 2022. So almost two years to date from the false accusations. What ends up happening here? Uh, I finally started listening to somebody that knew better, got a lawyer. Um, and you pled guilty? Is that what I'm seeing here? Pled no contendere, okay. um, which it's pretty much a not guilty plea, except the arrest, the prosecution has enough evidence to actually adjudicate you guilty. So that's your way of just saying, well, you got to prove it. The court orders and it judges that the imposition of sentences hereby withheld as to counts and places the defendant on probation for a period of 12 months under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. Right. So then you're under probation for 12 months. Under probation for 12 months. Caveat is if I stay on the straight and narrow, I do my 25 hours of community service, uh, and I take all of my drug rehabilitation classes, which I did take, um, if I get all that done in six months, 14 weeks of classes and 25 hours of community service, then... I can have uh, my record sealed. But then within those 12 months, you get arrested again. Within those six months, I had <laughs> had everything finished. I was two weeks, two weeks away um, from finishing up community service. Um, and I got arrested a second time. And this is the incident at the gym? Yes. TMZ released the arrest footage of this? Yes, TMZ did. Thanks, TMZ. Uh, August 20th, 2022 at 8.40 a.m., um, and this is the arrest affidavit I'm reading from. Uh, the undersigned has probable cause to believe the above-named defendant on the 20th of August, 2022, um, in Orange County, on 8-20-2022, I, Officer Barrero, responded to the gym in reference to an aggressive customer. I met with the victim, a senior employee at the gym, who stated verbally and in a sworn written statement the following. Uh, Victim stated in 8 20 2022, the arrestee, myself, Patrick Clark Jr., entered an area closed for cleaning and was asked to leave. Clark became irate and argumentative. At that time, uh, the employee told me that I would have to go to the locker room, gather my belongings, and leave. And I was told that I was not allowed to return. Um, says the employee stated the whole time Clark was loud and argumentative, making threats. Uh, they stated that they finally uh, escorted me out of the employee. Two employees escorted me out of the building uh, where a fight broke out. And I did end up biting the employee. I will say that. Yeah, the police officer says in the video that you, you bit the employee. Yeah, that was probably the lowest of the lows. So what ends up happening from this? Um, because of this second arrest, that was a violation of the probation that was agreed upon on the first arrest. Yep. Uh, 
And because it was a violation of probation, I was arrested at the end of that week, the end of the week of the second arrest. So the week that TMZ video came out, the wrestling articles start producing. uh, He's been arrested a second time. Dream has been arrested a second time in the same week. It's really getting out of control. It's all out spying. There was a report that you smashed someone's head through a car windshield or a car window. That's false. You're not going to find any paperwork any warrants or any affidavits uh, regarding anybody. So it's two arrests that week, one for the gym incident, one for the violation Violation of of probation. probation. Okay. I spent 18 days uh, in Seminole County Correctional Facility. Um, I did a lot of learning in that 18 days. I cried like a wuss uh, when my lawyer said, uh, well, it's the weekend. So you're going to be sitting until Monday. You won't see a judge till Monday. And then uh, he said, you'll probably be in here for 13 days. And I've never gotten closer to God in my life. Um, you know, you can't, you can't go into a situation, a facility, like a correctional facility, and be lost. To not have yourself, to lose yourself, as I said. Because uh, they don't care if you're Patrick Clark or the Velveteen Dream. Uh, everybody's got to recognize and everybody's got to play by the rules. So is this your rock bottom moment? The collective was the moment. I won't say any fight here. Uh, 18 days in jail. 18 days in jail. All of it. Mm-hmm. People don't realize this all happened within about a nine-month span, Hmm. all three arrests, um, the jail time served, um, and the 18 days of jail time served uh, cleared me of the remaining uh, probation, uh, probationary period, and it satisfied the uh, Florida State uh, as far as uh, the time I would have to pay. And that reminds me, I do need to apologize, one, to the employee at the gym. Um, I apologize for coming to your place of work, um, Mr. Roberts. I apologize for coming to your place of work and being disruptive, allowing the mess of my life to create a mess in yours. Um, And I thank you for being forgiving uh, and not pursuing charges. Um, I'm sure you could see where a man as myself was, where I was at that point in my life. And I appreciate the kindness and the uh, opportunity you gave me to get my shit together. Um, And I'd like to apologize to the Orlando and Seminole County Police Departments uh, because you two uh, were affected by my mess. Uh, And there's just no, there's no excuse. I'm sorry. And the best apology is change behavior, and I plan on proving myself. Um, Again, I apologize to Mr. Roberts um, and the Orange County and Seminole County Police Departments in Florida. Now, there's this story that EC3 told about a party at his house, Mm -hmm. and he alleges that you left your camera out in the bathroom recording people when they were going to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. What actually happened here? Uh, it's very simple what happened. EC3, myself, a young lady, um, and two former talents that I've worked with. Um, we were downtown Orlando, Wall Street. Um, the bars closed around 2, 2.30. Um, and EC3, Michael Hutter, he lives uh, in downtown Orlando. So EC3 invited myself, the two talents, and the female, uh, who I, I don't recall who she was, um, invited us back to his apartment. Uh, EC3 brings out a framed black and white picture of Tom Selleck uh, with a pile of cocaine on this picture of Tom Selleck. And he puts it down on his dining room table. And 
It's like, let's party, boys. Now, EC3 says he doesn't do drugs. Okay. Like I said, it all takes us the time that it takes us. And I know better than most that depending on where we are and what happens in our lives, we can find it extremely difficult to control certain aspects of ourselves. Um, I understand that. It's no question in my mind that EC3, uh, and, and I don't like calling my coworkers by their you know, wrestling name. I think it's going to take Mike the time it takes him, but it's going to be the same work that I've had to put in and the same work that many people in the world living and passed on have had to put in. And that work is step number one, admitting that there is an issue that needs to be resolved. Uh, and again, no question, I think that uh, substance, can't say abuse, but substances are an aspect of Mike's life that he has a problem controlling. Um, I've seen it recently. Uh, Mike still follows me on Instagram. Um, and as I did some digging, looked at some YouTube videos, uh, I saw that there was a show Mike was doing. He had the microphone in his hand and Mike EC3 is talking and berating the crowd. And someone from the crowd yells, why are you still following Velveteen Dream? Which is a great question because if you're going to make the claims that someone, uh, is trying to film you in the privacy of your own home, when substances and drinks are around. Um, forget whatever type of sexual uh, overtone EC3 tried to make with his accusation. Uh, I've got coworkers. We've got coworkers that we're in this room with. And you've got cocaine and Tom Selleck sitting over here at the table. You've got bottles of vodka and tequila and things like this sitting over here at the bar. It's just not a setting where you would want to have your phone out recording anything anyway, which I was never doing. Uh, I think at some point during the night, EC3 walked into the bathroom where my phone was laying flat, saw it, and maybe had some interpersonal conflict on how he wanted to deal with that. But that was never true. Um, EC3 makes this claim for the first time, to my knowledge, on the Wrestling Outlaws podcast, which is hosted by Vince Russo. Um, and uh, Dr. Chris Featherstone. Uh, and from my understanding, uh, Dr. Chris brings me up. Uh, this had to be the week of the TMZ video, right? He brings me up about a second arrest. Then EC3 just starts making stuff up. So this never happened? This never happened. It's the same narrative that the first two accusations were about. Uh, again, I have a past. I don't have a history. Three people on three separate occasions have tried to link me to a history of sexual delinquency, and none of it's been true. It's all been unfounded, and there hasn't been any legal paperwork or anything to substantiate or to back up anybody's claim. So with all of this, the apology video you put out on January 2nd of this year, with this interview that we're talking about here, and I, I am super grateful for you being as open and honest as you've been. Is your hope to wrestle again? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, at first, I tell you, when I got that call in uh, May that I was getting released as a part of budget cuts. That's I, what they told you? That's what they told me. Uh, Kane and Seaman uh, called me up. I was sitting in my apartment. It was a Thursday. Um, getting ready to go walk my dog, Bubby. And Canyon calls and says, hey, man, this isn't an easy phone call to make. I'm sure you've seen people getting released, uh, but we're letting you go. And with all the mud that I'd been dragged through, I just wanted to hear someone say, this is why we're letting you go. But uh, they kept it classy, and they released me due to budget cuts. Um, so, uh Again, you can't release me for anything else. There's no legal basis to release me 
uh, based off of what people make up on the internet. Um, AC3 has even gone so far as to say that uh, he reported this incident to the WWE. Again, there, that's not true. You're going to go down, if you don't wrestle again, you're going to go down as one of the biggest what ifs in wrestling history. What if you had kept wrestling? What if this hadn't happened? Because you've got people like John Cena and Triple H and Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels saying you're the next great thing. How does it make you feel sitting here knowing that you're a what if? Uh, I don't know if I'm a what if. Uh, I can see how that perspective can be gained, but I wouldn't say I'm a what if. Uh, I'm a what can and what will be. My story's not over. I'm not dead and in the grave. Uh, now, my wrestling career, maybe. Um, the Velveteen Dream, maybe. Um, okay, well, what will be then? I'm going to keep moving it one foot at a time, right in front of the other, taking it a breath at a time, because that seems to have been working out for me. I've never been in a more loving environment uh, than I am right now. I'm living on a farm with my cousin. Uh, he's producing wonderful black garlic and, and sweet potatoes, and we've got chickens to feed. We've got dogs to feed and water. I've got my mini Aussie doodle bubby. Um, I'm just in an awesome spot in my life right now. And for the first time, rustling has not been chirping in the back of my head. And I'm going to enjoy this. Now, we all get the itch. Uh, who knows? Um, never say never. Uh, but for right now, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm guessing that WWE owns the Velveteen Dream. That, yep. So if you do wrestle again, unless it's for WWE, you're not the Velveteen Dream again. Um, I wouldn't want to. I mean, he lived and he died in the same breath. He was loud. He was condescending. He was all the things you don't want in a person who you tell you love, you know? You don't want the Velveteen Dream in your lives. Um, you might want him on your TV screen, but again, I think the Velveteen Dream has taken enough uh, damage uh, collaterally uh, that we've decided to bury him and give him a nice little headstone, something that he'd appreciate. But... Uh, the dream is not over, but the Velveteen dream is. So are you saying your past is in the past? Are you in a new place now? Are you sober now? Yep. Okay. Very sober. Um, can't you tell? Uh, man, when I leave here, I'm going to fly back uh, home, undisclosed location. Uh, it's going to be snowing there. Already seen pictures. I get to spend time with my dog. I get to sleep in a home where we keep the doors unlocked. We can go into town and leave our keys in the car. We don't, uh, we don't have to worry. And I can even hear it in how I'm speaking right now, the we. Like, I have someone now. I have people around me that I trust and that I can lean on and that uh, I have no worries when I'm with. So uh, I'm going to do all right. Uh, and together, we're going to do a lot better. So if a promoter were to call you after this interview comes out and they say, Patrick, I'd love to book you on an upcoming show. We're going to see you back in the ring. Yes, because I need to know the answer to that. I don't know. I need to know. If it's worth it. And if it is worth it. Do I have the self-control and the discipline to carry myself like a professional? Do you think you do? I do. I do have confidence in that, my ability. Wrestling was so much a part of your life for so long, mm -hmm. and it hasn't been part of your life at all for the last three years. Mm -hmm. Do you miss wrestling? Uh, yeah. 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 Why'd you hesitate? Because it's a real 
It's a real question that I have not taken the opportunity to sit and think about the answer to. Um, easy. I mean, I could just say, yeah, Miss Rosalind, who doesn't? Because I want another book in. Uh, or I could just say, no, I don't miss it. I'm, I'm past it. I refuse to be tied to something that has given and taken so much from me. But those be forced, uh, those be forced answers. That's not the truth. Um, yeah, I miss it. I haven't been completely away from it. I still help people. But believe it or not, I do still help people. Um, I was just talking to a up and comer uh, from a prominent wrestling family who was talking about promos the other day. He wanted to know, you know, he's got his first big promo coming up, and he just wants some tidbits and some advice on, you know, how to approach it. You know, and as I mature, I realize, you know, it's all relative. How you would approach a promo is how you approach anyone you're speaking and trying to sell yourself to. You do it authentically. You do it with your heart in the right place. And you do it with love. That's the important part. Spreading love. Where do you feel like you're at right now? You said you're on a downward spiral. We we certainly documented that. Yep. Where are you at now? I'm in my happy place. And I'm in no rush to get out of it. I'm happy. All I need is me, my bubby. It's your dog? Yeah, that's my dog. That's my dog. Um, that's all I really need, me and bubby. But I need, I, need, I need other people around me to keep me level-headed, keep me focused, and keep my name out the mud. And you're working now? Uh, yeah, I work on a farm. Yep. Uh, really full services. We do a little bit of everything. Contractor work, uh, uh, carpet, painting. I'm, I'm a working man. I work. I've always worked hard. Uh, I don't think anyone would ever dispute that. And I just want to feel useful. And there's no better way to feel useful than getting on your hands and knees and working for somebody. Patrick, I want to thank you for your ability to speak openly about this. These must not be easy things to talk about. Certainly, I'm sure they're not easy things to hear. People say things about you or write about you. So I appreciate you. When you agreed to do this interview, you said, we can talk about everything. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have to talk about everything. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for that. And I end every conversation with gratitude because it's such a big part of my life. What are three things in your life that you're grateful for as we sit here right now? Uh, They're not going to change. Um, God, always grateful for God. He's the reason for the season, the reason why I have breath in my body and my lungs. I have the function of my limbs and my mental capacities to be able to come here and sit with you and, uh, you know, do this, uh, do this thing called life. So God is number one. Uh, two is unconditional love because that makes the world go around. Um, without love, uh, in my personal experience, without love from family and friends telling me to get off the couch and to go do something, to fight for my name, to fight for my life, if it's not for the unconditional love and support of the people who have watched me, uh, whether you knew Patrick Clark the Kid or you knew Patrick Clark from Tough Enough or you knew the Velveteen Dream, the love and support from those people that still have an interest in me. Do um, you feel loved now? I do feel loved. I do. Um, And then the third thing is opportunity. I have it here with you. Um, I may have it in the future with a uh, wrestling-focused event. Uh, I might not. I might have it in uh, another capacity, in another uh, field. Um, But I'm looking forward to more opportunity because if you trust in God, You love what you do. Your heart's in the right place. You spread love to other people, God's love, and opportunity keeps on coming. Those things line right up. And gratitude's always the attitude. So just thank you, Chris, for showing me some love, uh, showing me some opportunity, and allowing me to come here on your platform and to finally tell my story.